thank you all for coming. I'm just going to lay out my, just, just my notes. <laughs> um, so um, I did want to thank you guys all for coming. Um, I also want to thank Faith and David for allowing me to do this show. Um, I'm very honored to, you know, have a solo show in this uh, gallery. Um, and um, I know Faith put up with a lot of questions from me, so. <laughs> Um, so, um, so I was asked really to do a printmaking show. Um, printmaking is what I went to grad school for. Printmaking is what I love. Um, I also teach, you know, drawing, painting, um, and other stuff as well. Um, but printmaking is obviously, um, about 10 years ago, I, or more than 10 years ago, I took my first printmaking class and I just absolutely 100% fell in love with it. Um, it was kind of the medium I had been searching for. I had been a painter and done some fiber arts before and done a variety of different stuff. Um, and uh, printmaking is, if you, how many in here know anything about printmaking? Okay. So we have a few. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about printmaking because there's so much more to it than a lot, like I was painting before. Painting was pretty much straightforward. Um, printmaking is a lot about um, the different mediums. We have four different mediums within printmaking um, and then a variety of other stuff we're all trying to do. Um, so printmaking, we start with intaglio or etching, um, which is really basically taking a copper or a zinc plate usually and really using acid to cut out of the plate to get the lines. Um, once it's inked up, all the ink actually sits within the grooves that you're making onto the plate with the acid um, and then making a uh, print off of it. So I did want to, I meant, I meant to start off actually with um, the fact that printmaking is all about creating a matrix. So like in Italia, we're creating a plate and we're using it to print um, the same image over and over and over again. Um, so that printmaking is more of, um, it was started in, you know, off as a way to print um, artwork that had been done by like famous uh, painters and stuff and what they had done posting newspapers and things like that um, so that everybody could see what they had accomplished because not everybody was able to travel, you know, travel way back was hours and everything to get, you know, where they needed to be. Uh, so, um, so the, yeah, sorry. I'm, not the, I'm an artist, I'm not great at talking. Um, I'm visual, so I'm gonna fumble, um, but, um, so you have Italio, um, you also have Relief, which is woodcut, monotype, where you're inking up the surface and the ink actually stays on the surface that's left, um, so you're cutting away. Um, and then after that you have Litho, which is actually where um, the ink, it's about the idea of uh, oil and water don't mix. So the image area is, um, Using acid, you get it so it's non-water loving, and then the outside surface is water loving. So the idea that water and oil don't mix, um, you run over the image on a, usually a stone or an aluminum plate with oil-based ink, um, and the oil sticks to the image and repels off of the background. Um, so the idea is they're at the same level. There's no level difference First, the other two, they're, they're at the same level. Um, and then, of course, there is screen print. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with what screen print is. Um, mass production and t-shirts and everything has made it very um, known. Uh, it's basically taking a stencil and transferring it onto the surface. Um, so we also, within printmaking, we really do have um, an alternative printmaking is what they call it, alternative mediums, alternative, you know, ways of thinking. Um, we have, you know, of course, book arts. Um, it's becoming hugely popular. 
going a little bit more 3D, using our prints to create books or um, sculptures, sometimes people call them. Um, of course, we have letterpress. Um, some people call it printmaking, some people call it separate from printmaking. It all depends. Um, but letterpress really is, you know, putting in the type um, originally used to make things like flyers and letters and um, newspapers and things like that. Um, of course, we've gone into using our prints for 3D sculpture, um, installations. Some artists are out there doing print installations, um, as well as animations. There are a lot of printmaking artists out there doing animations, as well as I put wanted to include my animation in with this exhibition, along with uh, also artists using digital technology for other reasons. Digital technology is obviously coming into effect for all of you guys. Uh, everybody's knowing, uh, knows, you know, trying to use it in new ways to create new things. Um, cyanotypes is the one, you know, another way to create prints um, as well. Um, sometimes, you know, it's a crossover between prints and photography but it is a medium that printmakers are starting to use more regularly. Yes? Can I back you up and have you explain that term matrix? Oh, okay. So matrix is really the, it's, I mean, we call it a matrix. The matrix is the, you know, medium or the, the woodcut that you're using or the, the surface that you're using to print off of basically. Um, and by creating, you know, the surface, you are, you know, being able to create something that is going to last through time to be able to print over and over again. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so the matrix can be wood or copper wood, or... Wood, copper, um, you know, people use plexiglass for monotypes, people use, you know, there's this white stuff, I always forget the name of it because I've never used it where they carve into it like a woodcut. Oh, lino. lino. Well, lino cut, and there's also, oh, Something it's else. like a plastic oh. um, that they carve into. Uh, but lino cut, um, lithography, you know, the matrix would be on the stone or on um, an aluminum plate um, or on, there's a new thing called a Prando plate, it's a polyester, like thin plate, almost looks like mylar, oh, yes. that they're also, yeah, using. Um, or this, the screen, is the screen print? And the screen, matrix? screen print is the matrix, okay. right, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, in, you know, the contemporary world, we're trying to, you know, I wanted this exhibition to be about printmaking. Um, luckily, you know, there are a lot of artists out there who will only focus in, like, etching or screen print or, um, I do tend to like to do a variety of things. I don't necessarily want to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and I think when I was asked to do a printmaking show, I was like, oh, good, I can include everything and have it all work together and be as cohesive as possible. So um, so I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So do you ever blend different um, ways of printing mm -hmm. into one print? OK. Layering, whatever. So I have tried. Um, I usually don't like the end result for some reason, um, and I'm trying to do that more. Um, I have the one over here, the ability to cause change, which is two layers of a holograph plate, um, and then a photolitho plate on top of it. Can you um, explain what yeah. a holograph plate is? These so a holograph plate is basically um, you're actually adding to the surface and building up to the, up on the surface. I used actually a sheet of mat board and the lines I actually used a screen print um, so I screen printed onto the mat board and I put it on their three layers of screen printing to just build up the surface a little bit usually a color if you don't want too high because you want to run it through the press and you don't want to damage the press the press is made of you know a metal sheet and if you have something that is too thick for it it could indent the, the, the press roller um, so a holograph is usually you, like they say silk, like a layer of really thin that, um, and just a thin layer will hold the ink in underneath and not sit on the surface as well. 
it's a thin layer. So the thin layer is, so I would screen print three layers and it would just be high enough. You actually felt the plate, you'd feel it. Uh, just be high enough that the ink would sit in between the layers that I screen printed. Um, so, and then I actually coat the surface because it would actually, um, you know, a spray, I spray it with a, it would actually cause some, you know, um, surface tent, you know, surface dots where the ink would actually be able to sit in between the screen printed layers. Um, and then basically you ink it up very much like an, an intaglio or a copper plate where you're actually getting the ink into the grooves on the, on the surface. And then, of course, rub, rubbing away from the raised areas, which are only a tiny bit above, and then um, running it through. It's basically a way to do an intaglio plate without actually doing any acid or anything. Mm -hmm. But you can you can use things like um, you know you could add things like fabric onto it um, as long as you seal coat it with some kind of waterproof um, you can see what like put a piece of lace on it and then print the lace basically um, so I did two layers of collagraph and then the photo litho which is a new alternative form of lithography. Um, where it's basically an aluminum plate, but you expose it um, rather than the aluminum plate where you draw on it, um, on top of it. Um, so that one was somewhat successful. The other, I tend to end up, um, there is one down there that's a monotype, um, and then there is um, a dry point on top of it, which dry point is also very similar to etching. It's actually, the first step usually doing an etching class um, where you're actually carving into the copper or into the surface um, rather than using acid. Um, so you just use a metal point and you actually carve into it and then you ink it up very much the same way um, where you're pushing ink into those grooves that you just carved out. Um, What's so the process in most of these? What's the process? I was getting to my process. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> So, my process, and it was kind of the next step, but okay. Uh, my my process was um, my process is a very long process. So printmaking is a process. Um, it's not just straightforward, you know. It's it's not intuitive. You have to take a class usually in order to learn printmaking. Um, each process and step takes a while to you know learn and do. Um, so I also do my whole process within, you know, my steps. So I start off with an idea or sometimes an idea based on a sketch, um, something, you know, something someone said to me or I saw, like anything can spark my interest. Um, but I do start with an actual layout, a physical layout of my, of m m the work. It's usually very, very simple contour lines only on white paper. Um, I use big sketch paper, you know, and pretty much just contour lines only. Sometimes there's so many lines on it that I have no idea where the shapes actually are. And sometimes that's, that's, that's actually the exciting part for me. I'm like, okay, now I gotta sit down and figure out which shapes I wanna do in, you know, which color. Often I'm writing down and jotting down what colors I want or what things I want to be doing. Um, and then, um, then it does take a process. The color is not necessarily 100%, you know, decided right away. Sometimes it changes before I start printing. Um, so after I do the layout, I usually figure everything out and then create, of course, my surface or my matrix um, that I, I'm doing, depending on what medium I'm working on. Um, and then, of course, I go into, and I do say um a lot, it's just natural, so. Um, and I create, and then I go into the printing process. The printing process sometimes is the most boring part for me. It's not as exciting. Usually I've already laid everything out, I'm already there. It can get exciting when I've got multiple layers, which I do a lot of multiple layers because I want to be um, experimenting and each layer is like, ooh, how's it gonna turn out the next time? 
um, how's it going to turn out after the, I do this layer. Um, but often the layers are decided ahead of time. I go, okay, I want to do this shape first, then this shape, and then this shape. Um, the colors used to, so the colors for most of these, like these screen prints and the screen prints over there, um, it was layer by layer. Like I'd start off with a general idea of what colors I wanted, and it would go, uh, it would go, like as it would go, okay, what color should I do the next layer in? Um, often, um, yeah. So how do you get the various tones? I'm looking at this one, and mm -hmm. over here you've got something that's black and then very dark purple, and then mm -hmm. it ends up being lavender, but yet it doesn't appear that what's underneath is changing the color because you've got this white form Mm -hmm. But you still have darkness here and then it's lighter there. Okay, well this light form is actually the paper. That's the color oh, of the paper. No. Um, the first layer was this yellow green layer. Um, it looked more yellow green when I first had it. Um, but it was this yellow green layer. It's over pretty much the entire thing. This was done actually on plexiglass where I inked up oh. the entire uh, plate with this yellow green um, ink. And then I actually sat and cut it out, like wiped oh. it out. Um, you could put something on top of it and then run it through the press, but then they tend to move. Um, mm -hmm. So I actually sat and wiped each individual one out um, and oh, then ran it through the press. press. Oh, actually, maybe that one was the one where I was using. No. Yeah. No, I didn't wipe that one out. I did use some. A different color. No, well, no, yeah, I used, I put down some layers of acetone or something I to see. block it out, and I ran it through the press. Um, and I had it all mapped out on the underside of the plexiglass in Sharpie, um, and then would ink up the surface and then layer it down because I could see through, even because this ink has a little bit of transparency, see exactly where I was laying it down each time, because I did do an addition So what them. about up here, where you've got some very <clears throat> subtle changes in tone? Uh, this, okay, so this was the last layer I did. I did all these shapes first. These I would ink up and then wipe around and lay mm -hmm. down each of these shapes. If you notice, there are some transitions here. The ink on the roller, like I started, you know, on the, the plate glass with the roller, with a dark purple and then a lighter purple, and I'd roll it onto the roller okay. together. Mm -hmm. And then I right. rolled over mm -hmm. the entire area and then wiped mm -hmm. around. Right. Then, same thing with this and this. Mm -hmm. We're together on the same plate. Um, and you really had to map it out with the way that it was. You know, like I couldn't do this and this on the same plate because I couldn't roll across. Mm -hmm. So it was a different layer each time. Um, and then this, this, and this, and I might have done this while I was doing one of these because I could roll here and I could roll here, um, but I couldn't, so each one, mm -hmm. yeah. And then this was the last layer, so this was, I think what by the end, I was having some issues by the end of this, and I actually created this entire thing out of a huge piece of mat board, and I cut <laughs> it out, um, and then I inked up the entire mat board, so what I, what I did with this was I inked up the entire mat board with this uh, yellow ochre color. Mm -hmm. um, then I might have had one roll with the yellow ochre on it and one roll with half yellow ochre, half this uh, purpley color at the end. Mm -hmm. And I'd roll it here and then I'd roll it here. The trick is there usually would be some line here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the trick is to look at the surface and see if the line has disappeared enough, or there's enough ink on the surface mm -hmm. that that line disappears. Because you never have a roller this big. No. Yeah. Right. And or even even if you got a roller this big, you couldn't get that fade there. So you really have to pay attention to that line and have to know. Okay, I think there's enough ink on the surface. There's always still a line but there's enough ink on the surface where it's not gonna show on the print. Mm -hmm. If you look through some of the others, you might see that line there. Mm -hmm. It's not always 100%. Printmaking is kind of a challenge every time because 
It's not 100% where you know exactly how it's going to come out through the press. You know, um, it's kind of like, ooh, what am I going to get this time? Are um, all these editions? Or do you ever just So do most of my work, I like doing editions. Uh, most of my work is all, all the screen prints have an edition. All the etchings have an edition, even if they're small. Um, and these days, most of us in printmaking are doing small editions. We're not doing, like if you see so somebody many doing many 100, people. that's actually a lot. Most people do like years. 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of mine are five or six. Uh, some of them are three. A lot of the etchings I have like three. The bigger etching over there I have three. Um, and I have a couple actually. We do uh, something called an artist proof. Um, I have a couple where I have an edition of three and I have three more that, well, the first time I printed it, I didn't like the color, so I switched up. So that's an artist proof. I was just proofing it. Um, and then I have two more that turned out lighter. And I don't put them in the edition because they're not the quality that I want them. So I have two artist proofs, three artist proofs that are different than the actual edition. Um, and often the artist proofs are going to be different. Um, so. So, so each one is a layer process. Like I have this whole thing mapped out. Um, same thing with you know all of all of these. Um, I have started recently um, working with Photoshop to do my layouts, um, which is actually diff completely different. It's very much um, the different challenge and process because usually I do color kind of on the spot as I was printing, and I have you know. Sections, like some, some works I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna do this color. Like I have the whole thing and I go through and it'd end up with the result. But Photoshop, these five here, the manipulation series, the two and then the three over there, were all actually done, laid out in Photoshop first. Um, and it actually helped me because that one there that's like all, almost one color was like a zillion different colors at one point. And um, I think, I think it actually helped me play around with color a lot more, where I was able to see, okay, how would this turn out with this color? How would this turn out with this color? Um, I mean, it was screen printed. Screen printing is a little bit easier. You just, you know, you have a screen. I could do multiple different colors and test it out. Um, of course, you're wasting all that paper. And you gotta um, wash out the screen every time. And you have to wash out the screen right. every time. But are so, Photoshop colors really to what the color looks like when you print it. So right, okay, it. so that is the thing. The trick was to get it as close as I could. It's an approximation. It's an approximation. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot with transparency with screen printing, and I was using a lot of transparency in Photoshop. That one actually turned out pretty much like the image I had in Photoshop. Uh -huh. um, and same with this one over here. There's a, the purple one over there. That one's definitely off. It was definitely brighter in the middle, and I never achieved that. I ended up doing two of the layers twice to pull out the orange that I wanted in the background, and it never really came. So it was a challenge. Um, I think I like challenging myself. I like doing, you know, trying new things and doing those different things. And um, I see how it turned out. The other one next to the purple one was actually a lot greener, and I actually had just done this one that was green, and I was like, okay, that's enough green, let's go with blue. Um, and so the Photoshop image isn't exactly like, you know. So I, again, I did, I had it all laid out, this was the color I was gonna do, and that when it came to printing, I was like, no, I'm gonna switch off the color. Um, so I made quick decisions as I'm beginning to print that are very, you know, that can change the course of the outcome. Sometimes I add an additional layer, like I get to the end of it. Um, there's one down there, that one at the end, where I got to the end of it, I had the whole thing, you know, complete with from my layout and everything, and it was missing something. And I literally only had that afternoon, I had to sit, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this, and I ended up adding, there's a big arc through it, um, if I can point it out. Um, there's a big arc, coming down here, where is it, oh, this, this layer, and without that layer, this whole area just looked flat, flat. right, uh, so at last minute, I was like, okay, what am I going to do, and I just, yeah, why did you only have such a small amount of time, do you have a, oh, do you rent a, 
No, I was I was at a I was a sabbatical place. I just wanted to get it done. I oh, think okay. my <laughs> point my point was I just wanted to get it done, yeah. and I didn't want to have to come back another day. Got wanted it. it finished. Yeah. Um, so I was out sabbatical replacement in Michigan, um, and I was you know using their press and everything. Yeah. Got it. And yeah. That's what I'm always wondering about is like how do you have access to the press? Okay, so access to presses can be difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, in grad school I had plenty of access. Before that, I was taking classes at School and Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and I you know every single class I would take you know as a continuing ed student, and I had access to the you know during the school year. No problem. When you're at schools, you have access to presses. Once I got out, that is, so I was mostly a lithographer. Oh gosh. Right. <laughs> if you notice, there is hardly any lithography right. here in this show, other than a couple photo lithos. Because um, I was exploring photo litho this past year. So there are the two photo lithos, and that's about it. Um, <coughs> My lithography kind of ended after grad school because I didn't have access to a press. Um, luckily, I was doing a lot of the flat shapes with my lithography. It wasn't about the drawing on the surface. It was more about the flat shapes, layering the flat shapes. So I started screen printing. Screen printing is easier to get access to when you're at home. I do not have you know, a huge exposure unit. I do not have a washout sink. I do. I have a sink. I have. I don't have a washout thing. Um, and surprisingly, if you're not doing photos, it actually washes out pretty easily with just some water and a sponge. Yeah. Um, so the flat shapes are actually easy for me to get. These last ones I was experimenting with. I just bought a Cricut machine. If anybody knows. Oh, I saw it. Yeah. How is it? It's excellent. So those are pretty much all done. I started with the Cricut machine, and I was actually. Um, making these stencils and then actually attaching them to the surface. That gave me some issues because when your screen needs to be flat against the paper in order to get a perfect result. So when I have the vinyl that the Cricut machine cut on the back of the screen, there's actually a gap between the paper mm -hmm. and the screen, uh, which it can cause some issues you notice, like I've been using, a lot of these are also contact paper, same thing. The contact paper is on the back of the screen, between the screen and the paper. Um, so that at the edges where those shapes are, you can see little like gap, like uh, suction things that where the screen isn't necessarily getting all the ink onto the surface. Yeah. Right. Um, so I was doing that, and then the last couple, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try cutting out the image with the Cricut machine. I had a little exposure unit, so I'm gonna put the emulsion onto the screen. So you put an emulsion onto the screen, um, and then usually attach the image to it. So I'm gonna take the vinyl and attach the image to the back of the, the vinyl to the back of the screen. Then expose it. The vinyl blocks out the image, you know, where you want the actual image to go. Then, of course, you just pull off the vinyl after it's exposed, and it just washes right out. Fantastic. Right, which is great, yeah. Um, and I was like, and I can get, you know, so recently in the past several years, or uh, past year, I've really started using Photoshop and Illustrator a lot more. I was, if you notice, like, while I was screen printing after grad school, um, I was doing a lot of shapes. I was I didn't have access. I didn't have an exposure unit at that time. It was all contact paper or uh, using this method of drawing fluid, and you draw into the screen and you cover it with um, you know uh, your uh, blockout filler, and then you wash out the the drawing fluid. Um, so it was and it that can be a pain in the butt when you have no no washout sink mm -hmm. to get out the stuff afterwards. It took me hours to, to s scrub my screens. So I eventually just go, okay, I'm gonna block everything out with contact paper and get my results, which is what, how these happened. Um, so it was blocking out all these shapes, like this entire shape. I had a huge piece of contact paper that blocked this out on the screen, and then I screen printed this with a fake. Uh, or a rainbow roll is what we call it with the actual roller, so a rainbow. 
So there's three different colors here as I'm going up. Um, what and, about your cyan prints? Uh, okay, uh, I will get to that, yes. Um, so my cyanotype prints are, um, they were done right at the end of grad school. I was just actually learning cyanotypes. Um, they are, um, they are monotypes. They're one of a kind. There's only is that this one here? Yeah, these, okay. these. So cyanotypes are a process that you actually treat the paper so that it's going to react to the light. Um, and it, when it reacts to the light, it turns blue. Um, actually, it turns gray, and then once it hits the water, it turns blue. And anywhere that was exposed. Um, like all this blue area turns blue, um, depending on the time it's been in the exposure unit. And anywhere that wasn't exposed, all the you know, light washes out. So how this was created, how these were created, is anybody know those little glass beads that are, you know, glass fillers, base fillers, you know? They have a flat back and a rounded top. They actually create this image. Um, and I actually knew this because I'm not a photographer. I took photography one in undergrad. And I had a whole bunch of these, and I was doing things. And it was like that first day where you're like playing around and with objects and stuff. And they said, oh, you know, I had these little glass beads, and they did this design. And I was like, oh, that would be interesting to do. 15 years later, or 12, yeah, yeah, almost, fif almost 12 to 15 years later, I was like, oh, I can finally do this. Because I didn't, a lot of people do cyanotypes with, you know, photos or negatives or stuff like that. Um, and I was like, well, I don't want to do photos. I'm not a photo person. I want to, you know, and I ordered Amazon, of course, ordered like a thousand, some thousand of these. And <laughs> You individually have to sit there and make sure that they're all on their flat back um, and um, put them down onto the surface. Then I would use some, some ruby lift, which blocks out the light, um, to cover up certain areas. Because with like this thing, I don't think, I think the entire thing was almost covered. Um, I, you know, because I didn't, you know, and I would block out um, oh, actually, no, this one wasn't because this is where the light hit it. So I did have it in a shape. Um, but I would, you know, put it in for five minutes and then I'd block out like these sections. Put it in for another two minutes and add more ruby lift. Put it in for another three minutes and add more ruby lift. Put it, yeah. And so I'd continue. Now, to get this fade out here, I would actually um, remove, I think I removed all of them or I push them away and lock out almost the entire thing so that these would get exposed for like another two minutes and it would fade out. Now you can do this in the sunlight too, right? You can. So I tried that after grad school. Um, it took like hours in the sun. Not five minutes, it took hours. <laughs> and it would then, you put in the water and it would still like fade out. You could never get this deep darks mm -hmm. blues like I had gotten. Um, I was also having trouble with what I was, yeah. I, there are people who do it and. Yeah, my printmaking studio in South Texas, was, they were all like obsessed with this. Mm -hmm. And they would get that dark, dark blue in the sun. And I wonder if it's because the sun's sun. so right. powerful. I was also doing it in October. Yeah, um, right. Which the sun is not as bright there. I was also trying to, I had created some, some images on, um, tracing paper mm -hmm. using uh, acrylic paint and I was trying to like get them as flat as possible so I was putting like I didn't have an actual piece of glass so I was putting plexiglass on top and then plexiglass over an hour with you know bulge oh, right yeah, okay. and so I was having issues with that too mm -hmm. but I was having yeah I leave it in the sun just a regular thing for like an hour and a half put it in the water mostly it would be a really 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 light mm -hmm. light blue I just didn't have the time to sit there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in the middle of the summer it would be much faster. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Um, so, um, what about your steamroller? 
Okay. Um, so while I was out in Michigan, we did a steamroller woodcut event. Um, so um, I so we we would lay down. So you bring out a steamroller and you create wood like all the students um, carved MDF. Um, and they, we would bring out the steamroller, um, and you place them out, and there's a series of layers that you put instead of using the actual press, and then you run the steamroller over it. Like a um, real actual steamroller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, like a real actual steamroller. This was one of the ones that I did. I actually laser cut these out. So I started designing with Illustrator and Photoshop, and I laser cut them out of the wood and then I steamrolled it through the press. If you notice there's a big, you know, dab, that's because, gap yeah, there, that's because the fabric, you know, folded over on itself while printing. Um, so it's all part of the process. Again, printmaking is just naturally comes out mm -hmm. um, as it was, so. Why are all these printmakers using MDF instead of wood? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. It's okay. easier to carve. Softer. So wood, yes, is much softer. It's like a it huge piece of lino cut. It has no grain. That's why it's grain. easier to cut. Okay. Um, so lino cut also has no grain. It's easier to cut. Um, so MDF has no grain. It's easier to cut. You can go in any direction. Wood has more difficulties. You've got a grain there. If you go the wrong direction, all of a sudden. Pop out pop, right. Yeah. Yeah. You pop out a piece you didn't want, then you've got to fix it, or yeah. So it's just for. I mean, a lot of re other artists use it as well. And the uh, you know, yeah. it's just cheaper and easier to use. Um, so I did want to talk. I haven't talked about my work and what it. You know, I was a swimmer growing up. Um, I swam in high school, college, um, and since that, you know, water has always been a part of my life. I was always constantly swimming in the water. So right now I'm using water as my primary source to really reflect my own emotions and my own thoughts. Um, I use basically color, shape, and pattern as a way to express myself. Um, so like I'm really like the idea of water, it has reflections, it has movement, it has, you know, motion, um, and color can be so emotional. I do try to leave it up to like the viewer to get their own, I mean color has a quality within all of us. We all, you know, have our own memories with it. Um, color, yes, can mean certain things. Um, but I try to leave it very ambiguous so that people can um, really take away what they want from it. Um, if you notice, all of these cyanotypes are, um, are you know, um, the names of them, like this one says whirlwind, um, that one's filtered. Um, if you actually attach the word emotion somehow, filtered emotions, so, or whirlwind of emotions is how I call it, you know? And it was all about like emotional state. There's, you know, from within, emotions from within. Um, but I left out the actual word emotions because I didn't want someone to go, oh, okay, you know? I, I felt like that made it more ambiguous. They could take away what they wanted from it without the word emotions. To me, that's what it is, but, um, I, uh, yeah, so, um, so naming my pieces, if you notice, I have five new ones that I just did this past month. They're technically called Unentitled Manipulation Series. They're not named yet. They probably will get names. I just, sometimes it takes six months to get the right name. Sometimes it takes, you know, a day. They have not been named yet, and I don't even know what I will name them, but I'm sure it will come over time, so. Um, as well as, I titled this show Manipulation. The idea is water can be manipulated very easily. It's also something you can easily be, or I am easily manipulated by other people. Um, and, you know, I try not to be, but it's very 
it's a tough world out there. People are constantly giving you their advice and their opinions, and you're constantly being manipulated. I'm constantly being manipulated. You have to stay strong. Um, and so manipulation works with both the idea of water and movement as well as my own emotions. I don't know how long I've talked for, but. Um, so I did go through a phase where, you know, the whole shape phase. This last year I was trying to work with shape and pattern, it's really trying to combine them. And what ended up was I had the shape pieces and these pattern pieces. <laughs> And I think it was an exploration year, really. Um, and I was really exploring and trying to work together. And each time I'd go, no, it just seems like, like the etchings, they're all pattern. And I did them, and I was trying to get the shape involved. And it, I was like, but no, I don't want to add shape to it. Um, so the idea to go from here is really to go with shape and pattern and try to combine it. Um, I had done a lot of that in the past, just for some reason when I got out. Probably had a lot to do with the fact that I didn't have an exposure unit, um, that I was stuck with these basic shapes. I even tried over in that one. Um, there's, there is a pattern with that geometric, you know, um, that uh, checkerboard square. But I kept having the contact paper because it was little tiny squares. The smaller contact paper, the more it tends to fall off and stick to the paper. Um, so I kept having to print, okay, did they stick, stick it back on the screen and keep going, and that's a pretty big pattern. So then I had trouble with that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I now have the Cricut, which will really help me get very small patterns, is very exciting, so. Mm -hmm. Those ones that are on, like those like word blocks, uh-huh. Is it paper that's then attached to them? No. Okay. So in grad school, I did a whole thing where, yes, I lithoed onto paper, and then I attached the wood blocks as a presentation. Okay. Um, those are actually screen printed right onto the wood. Um, but they are mounted after I screen printed them. Um, yes, because the surface is raised so high, if you have the box, and then brought the screen down. You'd have to, you couldn't clamp it in because there would be no space for it. Um, and then the lining up would be really, really horrible each time because usually you flood the screen first, so you can't really even see where you're laying it down. It needs to be. So I had the piece of birch bark, which is only a quarter of an inch thick cut, and it was raised a quarter of an inch, but it didn't usually make that much of a difference. Um, and that I would put underneath and then screen print on top. And they, those are additioned on regular paper as well. How do they get attached to the box? Then I take it and I make the box, the frame that's underneath, and I actually clamp it on. Clamping it on, um, I usually do have a, you know, some pieces at the corner on the print. I actually usually have, I, at that time I think I had some blank pieces of wood, they're that exact same size. So I put those face down and I clamp the back of it mm -hmm. onto the bottom of, you know, the wood piece and glued it on. Um, wood glue. With wood glue. Yes. That's what glue, so I just need to know. Wood glue, <laughs> yes. No, nothing else. Cool. Just wood glue. Do you like that presentation? I, I do. I've always wanted to do more. Right now in my studio, I can't even cut wood in my studio. They won't allow it because I'm on the second floor and the things go up and go down. Um, so I do like to make all these frames. I did cut them at home on my porch. But um, cutting big, giant pieces of wood, because I usually get it like four by eight, right. you know, if it's in my car, four by three. But then these huge pieces of wood, cutting them down might be a little bit of an issue. Um, if I really want to, you know, I've got some that I previously had cut that I still haven't gotten to yet. But yes, that was the tradition I was gonna go with the screen printing on wood. Um, things happen in life. You don't always get to what you want. But um, then I was in Michigan for a semester and I took advantage of the press. Right. Um, so, yeah. I love those ones. So, yeah, I get a lot of comments on those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, a little bit more. I have a whole series of these puddles um, that, I call them puddles, 
they are all done via Illustrator. So I take, I design patterns in Illustrator, I take them to Photoshop, I manipulate them and work them. Then I usually uh, design the shape based on the manipulation of the hue, you know, because it's just a square, uh, based on what I get. Um, and I definitely tweak them and pull them, and if anybody knows Photoshop and Liquify, you can go in. I've gotten pretty used to it. At first I was just like, okay, that'll do. And then I go, I've got to figure this out. Um, and then I take the shape, and then I bring it back to Illustrator. To laser cut it on a machine, you usually have to uh, have it in Illustrator or some other programs you can use. But you, I bring it back to Illustrator and image trace it. Um, and then I put it into the laser cutter machine. A lot of these, like this one, I actually did laser engraved right into matte board um, and, and just relief rolled it. So I rolled across the surface. Um, and they were just easily designed. This would be something like, I would design the pattern in Illustrator, because there's the nice little pattern maker, uh, bring it into Photoshop, liquefy it. This is when I could take this and then I would cut out you know, the shapes that I wanted. Um, or the shape that I felt like it needed um, and worked with, and then bring it back to Illustrator. These I just kept as tiles. Um, so, and there's a whole little series of them. There's three that are very similar. Really, I was experimenting with color um, and design in those, and then a couple bigger ones that I did, the bigger one towards the front there. Um, and that one, was out of matte board actually encoded and I actually inked the grooves and did a relief roll across you know, all in one print. Um, so yeah. And then I talked about those. Same thing with these a little bit. Those were all laser cut. Um, and then these were and these were really much older. These are probably these are before grad school, but I felt like they went with the theme of the show. Um, really, this is actually an Intaglio plate, um, printed once through the press. It's the same Intaglio plate, copper plate, just a little copper plate, um, that I would ink up, um, and then I'd actually use a paintbrush and paint onto the surface, just like a monotype, not very heavy, and run it through the press. Um, so I actually did a series of these, probably did 130 of them. Um, and that's, those are three, that 130. Some of them have been tossed out, unfortunately, because um, I actually did a little floor installation with them. And then it got to the point where they're all attached to these foam blocks that I had made, and I couldn't keep them in. <laughs> so, yeah. I have what's left. What didn't make it into the floor installation is what's left. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Do any of the students have any questions? Yes. When you started, did you see it as more of a long-term art that you could pursue or more of like a short-term craft? So I started out, I was an illustration and graphic design major in undergrad. Um, I, you know, spent a couple, 10 months living at home afterwards and I, just up and moved to Boston. Um, I, I, you know, started temping in the city, um, and I got hired on at a medical center. Um, I did that for six, to almost six or seven years. Um, I was taking classes at Mass Art and the Museum of Fine Arts, um, and I, you know. I think my first semester I took an illustration class at Mass Art, and I walked in and I was, you know, meeting people in the class and, you know, there were a lot of people who said, I graduated from Mass Art, you know, 10 years ago. I haven't touched art since. That scared me because I was only like a year out of undergrad um, or a year, it was probably the fall. I spent a year, and then that fall, I was taking a, a class, and that scared me. I was like, it was a year, and I hadn't, you know, really done anything. Um, and 
here in Mass, only 10 years, graduated from Mass Art, you know, hadn't touched art in 10 years. They had gotten an administration job, just like I had gotten, and probably, I don't know if they had a family, but probably did, and that was their life. And I was like, that can't be me, I cannot do that. <laughs> um, I have to continue my work. Um, and you know, I did spend several years where I was only taking like one class a year, or I'd go a year without a class, and it could have very, very easily happened, easily. I could have just continued on my job, I continued going, and I think it was this thing in me, I had to do it. I had to do something within the arts. If I had gotten a job like doing graphic design or something, in that, I probably wouldn't be here today. Because I, the idea was, is I was in an administration job not doing anything related to my field, not doing anything art related, and I had to continue it. I couldn't just sit around. I was the person doing crafts my entire life. I sat in the corner on my weekend, sat in the corner, and I created wreaths and crafty things from AC Moore and like everything, you know? And I couldn't just not do my art. Um, so I was in the city, and I eventually, I think it was, I, so many, what many, I went to UMass Dartmouth, oh, just okay. south of Boston. Um, and I had, I had actually applied for a painting degree several years prior. So I had been painting a lot, that's what I had been doing. Um, I was gonna go for an MFA in painting, and I actually, I heard something about the college that wasn't good. About UMass Dartmouth? No, I, it was Kendall College of Art and Design out in Michigan. Oh, okay. And I just heard something about the college that wasn't good. That kind of interested me. I just started taking my painting classes, and I was falling in love with it. And I was just like, and I mentioned something to my advisor, and I go, would I be able to take printmaking and do printmaking? And she just goes, we'll worry about that many months from now. And I was just kind of like, I think I'm falling in love with printmaking enough that I don't want to get an MFA in painting. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually signed up for classes and everything, and I pulled out. Um, and then I spent the next several years taking classes at School Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and I was really, you know, getting to know every single medium, everything I was doing. Um, I felt like I had to go to grad school knowing the medium. Um, some schools will allow you to go to grad school and not know the mediums, but I felt like I had to. Um, and actually, I think UMass Dartmouth was one that would have allowed you to go even if you didn't know all the mediums. But I, I had to know. It was, you know, so I took as many classes as I could. Um, I, you know, got my portfolio together. Uh, applied. Um, I almost went to the U Arts in Philly. Mm. I think I was a little worried about being in the city. I was in Boston. I don't know why I was worried about being in the city, but it was ex more expensive. And yeah, so I went to U.S. Dartmouth, um, and I graduated, and then I went back home, and then that was the trip because my parents are those type of people who are, you have to get a job. You have to go get, you know. Uh, the, he, I mean, like a job job. A job job, yeah. right, <laughs> right, honest. right. I wasn't, you know, a job job, like administration job. What I was doing before in Boston, mm -hmm. that was right. And I fought that for the first two years, really fought it. And I worked retail, and it was, you know, not paid enough. And but I feel like then I got my teaching jobs, and then it's just gone from there. So, so where are you teaching yeah. now? I'm teaching at SUNY Adirondack. Right now, it's a community yeah. college in upstate New York. What city is that? Uh, Queensbury. It's it's up north. Um, it's just one class right now. Like Syracuse, you know? No, 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 north Pot of Pot, south of Potsdam. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Saratoga Springs area. Oh, yeah, yeah. Little okay. around there, All just right. a little north of there. Um, yeah. You like me? I love teaching. I was actually, I spent the semester in Michigan, and I was in Chicago for a couple months. Um, Chicago, people are mean. I've never been there. People, you would think it's the Midwest. I just found people rude and right. So 
I, I go, I want to be teaching because I wasn't teaching out there last semester. Anyway, like I tried and tried and it was like, well, you can go to Art Institute of, of Chicago. So pretty much, or Columbia College. And it was just like, okay. And well, I want to be teaching. So I, I con honestly, I contacted ACC or SUNY Adirondack and he was like, like 12 hours later, he was like, I emailed him the night before. He emailed me the next day. I was like, oh yeah, I have a class. And I'm like, great, moving home. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I love teaching. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you miss Boston? Yes, all the time. Well, that's why I went to Chicago. I was like, I don't want to go back to Boston right now, but I want a city. Mm -hmm. And then Chicago wasn't the same. Yeah. So, Boston is unique. Yeah. So, I miss Boston. All the students. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Well, this has been very enlightening. We I mean, so really much. went into depth talking yeah. about everything. Well, I was trying. Can I ask you a few more questions about are they scientists? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I have to get to my first question. Oh, do you so purchase a paper that apply the photosensitive pigment? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, so, where okay. Do you so you do have to size the paper yeah. in advance uh, using arrowroot, oil arrowroot, and, uh -huh. you know? Then you size the paper. Yeah. Usually both sides, just to make sure. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, you mix the solutions, a two-bar solution, so yeah. you mix it together. But where do you where do you get those? Online. Okay. Um, I, I think there's that Good photo program. place in New York City that sells it. Right. Yeah. Um, B and H. B and H. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and you mix the solution, and you have to use everything that you've mixed, you know, so you have to be careful. Okay. Um, because it is, you know, has a time sensitive once it's mixed. Yeah. Um, it's like epoxy, you know. Um, you burn and you spread it over the, yeah, you wipe it over. Make sure that there's only one layer, yes. You do have to make sure there's only one, you know. You can see it. You can see it, like watercolor, drag it so that, you know, you're covering the entire thing, but you're not um, over layering it too many times. Um, and then are those, so those are just two different exposures. Same. Chemistry, same chemical, everything. The two blues. I'm right. Sorry, yes. Photo, just just yeah, two different. Because they almost look like different yeah. blues. <laughs> right. Well, it depends on what you get. I think, or how long it's been. Yeah. Um, this one, I did cover this section as I was going down a little bit. Yeah. So the blues do change to the bottom where this was like only like 25 minutes. Uh -huh. I love um, it. Okay. Whereas these were all like 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. Are there other colors, or it's just blue? Cyanotype, that's yeah, just cyan. cyan. <laughs> there are people who uh, uh, bleach it yeah. and then like dye it with tea or something. Okay. Um, I also, I use, there's a photo litho over there. It was actually a digital image of the cyanotype that just kind of faded a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then I manipulated it in Photoshop, oh, yeah. um, adding that, you know, drip that's in the middle or that groove that, yeah. I, on the top, and then I put it on a photo litho plate, and then I could print it whatever color I wanted. So. <laughs> Have you done any collaborations with other artists with different mediums other than printmaking, like painters or? I don't a lot, no. Okay. Um, it's something I think for future, you know, yeah. would be interesting, but it's. It's harder once you're not like in a school setting. Yeah, it really is. Sure. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. So yeah. I was curious. Yeah. I, know some I think also there. like I know people like out in Chicago who were doing that. Yeah. But it's a city. There's like more access. Like I'm in a studio. Everybody keeps their door shut. No one really talks <laughs> to each other. And that's the way it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So what are your plans? Hmm? Looking for teaching jobs? Oh, looking for teaching jobs, I keep applying to all the full time jobs. Yeah. And, nice. you know, um, right now I'm working on a graphic design job mm -hmm. and teaching at the same time, which helps pay the bills. Yeah. 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 So, the adjunct teaching does not pay the bills. No. <laughs> we know that for yeah. a fact. <laughs> right. Unless you're teaching like five classes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this has been awesome. Well, I hope. Yeah. It's really been nice.
Well, I tried. Once you got going, you really had a lot to say. Right. Well, it, it, I mean, it, it takes me a while to get going, and then I was asked questions that were like further in. So I was like, so oh, was I, so I was asking of what I wanted, but. Right.